Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Patrick here. I want to thank you for joining us today for today's message from our Rosemont Grace here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Just a quick reminder, if you have not already done so, please go join our social media pages at the links below down here. You can see them. And also remember, visit our website to make those weekly tithes. If you have not already done so, you can set up those recurring tithing donations through our website today. We're going to take a look at Solomon's prayer and dedication at the temple and ask ourselves a question. Are we truly using our lives and our bodies as a temple for God, for others to see? Great, great message coming here from Pastor Andrew. So let's go ahead and dive into today's message. All right, so I, I didn't want to distract some of you guys. You know, no, you're going to be excited the whole time if I got buccaneers on my, on my shirt. So I put, I put a different shirt on so that you can concentrate on what we're talking about today. Right now, we're in the middle of a series in 1 Kings. Who's been excited and learned a lot in this series so far? I have. This stuff's pretty, pretty cool. Um, how many of you went online and tried to look up pictures of the temple after last Sunday? Okay, yeah, we know, I know that some of you did, and you were talking about it. It's it's really, really interesting the way this whole temple concept came together, and, and I was excited last week as we read through it. Now today, we're going to be looking at the dedication of the temple, and in order to do that, I'm going to have to read everything that's there. And so I invite you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. We're going to do things a little bit differently and that I'm not going to go through and give you points along the way. I'm just going to read it and I'm going to talk to you about what's going on because I want you to understand the state of affairs in Israel that day. I want you to understand what King Solomon was doing and what was happening. Okay, so the temple has been put together. Remember, they built it off site and they came in and they, and they put it together in reverence and, and it's full of gold all over the place inside. You've got the Holy of Holies, you've got the main holy place, you've got the outside, the courtyard, you know, where they did the sacrifices. And it's just an absolutely beautiful picture of God's invitation to come to be cleansed of our sins, to, to rebuild that relationship that we broke in the garden. All right. So you guys remember that from last week. Well, in this series, in, in 1 Kings, what we're seeing is, is this setup of God's kingdom through, through covenants. We see that God makes promises to his people, and he says, hey, people, I'm going to do this thing. I, I'm going to build my kingdom. Now, I'm asking you to make this covenant with me to say that you're going to walk in my ways in order to experience the blessings of that kingdom. And we see what happens in 1 Kings when, when, when God's people put aside the covenant and decide to do what they want to do and they don't listen. And now we're not there yet, but today we're at a massive celebration, okay? So um, it was probably a little strange this year, but for the most part, what happens after graduation? You know, when, when someone graduates high school, there's a big party, right? And people get excited, or even the graduation service itself, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance, right? It's a big deal. Or what happens when... Um, you know, someone has a, a 50th wedding anniversary, or what happens at a wedding? It's a big service, right? And it's exciting, and people are, are in tears, tears of joy, they're happy, they're excited about what's going forward, they're, they're praying for the couples as they go forward. It's, it's these sort of things. So I, I want you to understand and kind of build in your mind that a celebration is about to happen. A celebration is about to happen in Israel that has not happened in years, and it's going to be one of the biggest celebrations in their entire history. And, and so I, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8. Now I'm going to read a few verses here, starting at the very last verse of chapter 7. It says this, 1 Kings 7 verse 51, it says, When all the work King Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold and furnishings. And he placed them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. So they brought everything valuable, and he, and he put it in the temple almost like it was a vault. It was like, God, this is yours. This is for you. That you, you do with it what you want through this kingdom and through your people who are following you. All right, and so chapter 8, verse 1, this gets really, really interesting. It says, Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of Israelite families, to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. 
all the Israelites came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the month of Etanim and the seventh month. Okay, so what this sets up here is this. The temple work is finished. It is built. It's ready to go, and Solomon says, boom, it's time to celebrate this thing. And in this celebration, it's time to dedicate this temple. Now, what I, don't, I don't want you to get lost in the physical aspects and the physical ideas of the dedication as we read in this chapter. What I want you to listen and, and hear for is King Solomon's heart. Okay, so, so kind of chalk that up in your mind. I am, today, I want to hear what King Solomon's heart is in this dedication. I want to hear what his motivation is, what he's excited about, what he's remembering, what he's hopeful for in the future. And, and so that's kind of where we're at with this. But there are some interesting points in this first few verses, which is why I had it written up there for you, because it talks about when this thing took place. It says in verse 2 that all the Israelites came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in this certain month, which was the seventh month. This festival was, was the last festival of all the great festivals of the year. If you've, if you've heard anything about Jewish custom and, and the way that, that it worked in Israel, they, they had festivals all throughout the year to celebrate and remember what God was doing for them and what he had done in the past. And this was the big one. This was a really big one here. This was the festival of the tabernacles or the festival of booths. Now, what happens in these festivals where the people would go out and they would build little tiny booths or something, some temporary shelter, and they would celebrate. Now you're thinking, why? that's weird. Why are they building temporary shelters? They've all got their homes. Why are they living? Why are they camping? That's what happened. They're camping. They set up a camping. Uh, they went away for a camping retreat, and, and in the camping retreat, they remembered something. They remembered the time that they actually lived in that situation of constant camping. And what was that? The Exodus, 400 years earlier, God had taken his people out of Egypt and he sent them on their, in their journey to the promised land. And they were constantly, constantly living in these, in these booths, in these tents, in the wilderness as they had traveled and traveled and traveled to get to the place of permanent rest for them. All right. So they, 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 they were excited and this was this festival. And so they were remembering God's grace and God's mercy and his victory in pulling them out of slavery, and pulling them out of the wilderness here today into a permanent place. At least that's, that was their understanding. All right, let's go ahead and um, continue reading here, and I'll explain some more. So we're going to read all the way from verse 3 to verse 13. <clears throat> it said here in verse 3, When all of the elders of Israel had arrived, the priests took up the ark. And what was the ark? The ark of the covenant. Remember that, right? We're not talking about um, Harrison Ford and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. It, yes, they were referring to that, but this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about God's ark. The priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tent of meeting and all the sa sacred furnishings in it. The tent of meeting was the tabernacle. This, this tabernacle is what was in place before this massive, amazing temple was built. This tabernacle was considered the tent of meeting. It's the place where God came down and met with his people. All right? So this was a constant, temporary. They had to set it up and take it down every time they moved. Okay, so now think about it. They, they took the tent down from the other side of Jerusalem, from, from the city of David, and they take it down, and, the, and then they bring it up, and they put it in the temple. And they come in with the ark. And it says in verse 4, it says, The priests and Levites carried them up, and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel had gathered about him, were before the ark. And they were sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. Think about this. Everyone was bringing their sacrifices. They were so excited. that They were, they were just bringing so much that they couldn't even count it. They couldn't keep track of how many sacrifices were happening. For every step that they moved that ark from one place to the next, there were constantly sacrifices were happening. It's, it's a beautiful story. So, so can you see tons of people in your mind? Can you see them all bringing with, with grace and humility their sacrifices before the Lord and, and they're being thankful and excited about what's happening here, what this actually means? And it says, um, 
in verse 6, that the priests then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary, into the Holy of Holies, um, the most holy place, and they put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. Now, remember the cherubim, right? These were two massive cherubim. You know, they stretched from their wings up. There were two on each side, one on each side, and their wings went all the way from one wall to the other wall, and they connected in the middle, and right in the middle of that, these guys dropped down the ark, okay? They set the ark of the covenant down. All right, let's continue. It says in verse 7, the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and overshadowed the ark and its carrying poles. And these poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in the front of the inner sanctuary but not from the outside of the holy place. And they're still there today as of this writing. There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. Remember how many details we talked about last week? There were a lot of details in the passage, but there are some details here, but there are some, every single detail has a meaning. And did anybody think it was kind of strange how much they talked about how long these poles were? Yeah, right? It, it's weird. Well, what did they need the poles for in the first place? Well, to carry the ark, right, Miss Mary? They, they, they put the, the poles, and they were long poles, and they had, they had priests carrying on either side. And so they would walk with this thing to move it from place to place. Now, why would they still need these Poles for movement if they were setting it in a temporary place. See, this is where the details are. This is how God works. He says, hey, I don't want you to forget where you've come from. I don't want you to forget what I've done for you. I don't want you to forget the time that you were temporary and we constantly had to move from place to place. I want you to remember that I was faithful to pull you through that and I was faithful to bring you here today and do exactly as I said I was going to do. And so that's kind of the stuff that we see here in this whole passage, these little details, and they all point to something. It's really, really exciting. So in verse 10, it says, um, when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. Verse 11, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Okay, so you see what happens? Now, we remember the Ark of the Covenant was what? It was... It was considered the place where God would come meet his people. And it was the place, it was on the ark, on the mercy seat, where, where the high priest would come in once a year and he would sprinkle the blood of atonement. He would sprinkle the blood that said, hey, this is to uh, satisfy God's wrath because we've sacrificed animals in place so that God, so that you can see this blood shed and cleanse us from our sins. Okay, so, so that's what this ark represented. And it was God's presence on the mercy seat, and it says that the second they set it in the temple, boom, the cloud fills the temple, and the glory of the Lord filled it up. Now, this had happened another time before, 400 years before. It happened when Moses had done this. When they, when they built the tabernacle and, and, and Moses was in the tent of meeting the first time, it said Moses couldn't even fulfill his duties because the glory of the Lord came down on the place, and the cloud filled it, and it was just absolutely amazing. Now, can you imagine these people here? They'd only heard stories of this glory. They'd only heard stories of this cloud. They'd only heard stories of God's presence actually being there. And now for the first time in their lives, they essentially get to witness it. It, it had to be terrifying, but exciting at the same time. And it made it all the more real for them. Because what happened? When God's glory filled the temple, it was so much was, was being said in that. It was like, hey guys, I am here. I want you to know that I'm settling here. And then just as your people, are, that you are a people who are rested, I'm resting here in this temple. And it let people know where they could go. It let them understand that God was accessible. From Solomon's point of view, it was, it was God's confirmation and affirmation that, hey, you're doing the right thing in the right time, and I appreciate and I love what you're doing for me and how much you respect and revere me. And so I'm going to show up. And so that's what happens there. In verse, verse 12, it says, Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud, 
I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. Now, does anybody think that's strange? God said he would dwell in a dark cloud or a thick cloud. It is a little bit strange, but, but there's a beauty and a grace in this. Because who has seen God and lived? Moses on, on the mountain had to turn his back and be hidden in a crack as God's glory passed by. Because it would have killed him to see him. And so what God does in his mercy is he says, look, I'm going to cover my glory in a way that at least for a second you can see what's going on and understand that I'm here. And so it's, it's this idea. Something else here that was in the ark as I, I kind of glossed over it were the, the Ten Commandments. And that was important to remember that the Ten Commandments were in there. That was the covenant that God made with his people. He said, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love me. Revere the Sabbath. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't cheat. Don't lie. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Honor your father and mother. Basically, if, if you love me, you will do these things. And I want you to walk in this love, and I want you to walk in obedience to me. And so inside the ark was, was the remembrance of that. It was actually the, the tablets themselves. But here's the, the really weird thing about it is the tablets in and of themselves would be terrifying. Because they knew they were breaking the laws. They knew they were breaking every single day. Someone was, was sinning in some way towards God. But the beauty of it is that the mercy seat sat right on top. And so their sins could be covered by the blood of a lamb. All right, we'll move on. And there's a lot of little tidbits here. I just want to kind of build this story for you so you see what's going on. And, and Solomon looks and he says, I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you to dwell. Now, that's a little bit strange. Because we sit here and we go, how can God dwell in a temple? How can he be there in this place if he's everywhere? Well, we're going to get, get to that in a little bit. But see here in this first part, we see that the temple's completed. We see that it's furnished. We see that the Ark of the Covenant is being brought in and loaded in there. God covers the temple with his glory by way of a thick cloud. Then we see something special happen. We see King Solomon, over all these people, he praises God and he, he reminds them of God's faithfulness. I want you to look at verse 14 with me. It says, while the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and he blessed them. Then he said, praise be to the Lord. So he's looking at these people and he's saying, look, guys, God deserves all our praise. God is the one. He's the Alpha and the Omega. It says, the God of Israel who, was with, who with his own hand has fulfilled what he promised with his own, own mouth to my father David. For he said, this is what God said, Since the day I brought my people, out, is, people Israel out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city in any tribe of Israel to have a temple built so that my name might be there. But I have chosen David to rule my people Israel. Verse 17 says, My father David had it in his heart to build a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, you did well to have it in your heart to build a temple for my name. Nevertheless, you're not the one to build the temple, but your son, your own flesh and blood, he's the one who will build the temple for my name. Verse 20, the Lord has kept his promise he made. So this is Solomon talking. He's talking to the people. He's saying, look, guys, this is what God did. And he's reminding them of what he said and how God had come through. And he says, I have succeeded David by my father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. And I've built a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. I've provided a place there for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord, the Ten Commandments, that he brought with our ancestors when he brought them out of Egypt. Okay, so this is a, it would be like if I, if I came up here today one day, if we were having a celebration, and I said, hey guys, don't forget what God's done. Do you remember that God said, uh, you know, lean on me, you know, for your understanding. Lean on me to know where to go. He says, trust in me with all your heart, and I will direct your paths. And I, and I could be up here, and I could say, look, we trusted God 10 years ago, and look how he's directed our path every step of the way. This is what's happening here. Solomon is reminding the people 
of God's faithfulness. And it's really great. I told you I was going to do a lot of reading today, right? We're going to read the Bible today in this, past, in this, in this service. This, will, this is our text. This is my outline. We're just following this. All right, so for this next section here in 1 Kings 8, verse 22, this is where Solomon turns to God, and he directly speaks to God. See, before he was talking to the people, and now we get to see Solomon's heart. I'm going to take a drink here a minute. I hope you're following along in your Bibles, because this stuff is it's really beautiful to see what Solomon's doing here. And so, 1 Kings 8, verse 22, it says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord, in front of the whole assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands toward heaven. Okay, can you see this? He's standing before everyone. There's a crowd of people in front of him. He's standing in front of the altar of God outside, and he, and he raises his hands to heaven. What's he doing? He's praying. He's praying to God, and listen to what he says. Lord, the God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who kept your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Okay, so one of the things that I, I wouldn't say I struggled with, but I was just kind of like, okay, I'm trying to understand what this is about, was this whole time, how many times have we heard King Solomon or David reminding the people or reminding themselves or reminding, reminding one another of God's faithfulness. It's all the time. It's all the way throughout this book. We constantly keep seeing, remember what God did. God did what he said he was going to do. And so I just think it's really important that we need to remember those things. And so he goes forward and he says, he looks at God and he says, God, you're one of a kind. There's none like you. Do you remember When the disciples looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, how should we pray? Do you remember what his response was? Pray like this. What did he start with? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He said, God, you're special. Your name is holy. In other words, he looked at his disciples and he says, you've got to understand your place. In order to understand your place, you've got to understand how amazing and awesome God is. And so for you in here today, I want you to remember this. And I want you to think about this. Put your mind in in these people as if you were there that day and you're hearing this prayer. I've got to remember who God is. I've always got to put him at the forefront. I've got to know who he is. And I want to continue wholeheartedly in his ways. In verse 24, it says, Solomon continues praying to God. He says, you've kept your promise to your servant, my my father David. With your mouth you've promised, and with your hand you fulfilled it, as it is today. 25, he says, now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, "You you shall never fail to have a successor to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me faithfully as you've done. And now, God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. Okay. So he's continuing to praise God. And he's looking at God and he's saying, God, I I know who you are. And I know who I am and I know who these people are. And I know we've got our problems. So, God, I beg of you to continue with us. And then verse 27 comes in, and he says, but will God really dwell on earth? Remember what he said back before in verse uh, 13. He said, I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. And then he comes back in this prayer in verse 27 and says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. He looks and he says, God, I know you can't be contained. I get it that you're, you're above all things. I get it that you're sovereign over everything. I get it that your entire creation is always before you. 
And so to, to say that I can build this thing that will house you is just, it's, it's absolutely crazy. But, but I understand, God, that you're giving us a glimpse of you in this, even though we can't contain you. Okay, so this makes me realize that, that here, we have to remember who God is all the time. And we can't get, we can't get lost in our language. We can't minimize who God is by trying to put him in a box. We've got to constantly, always be going back to the amazing awesomeness that is our God. Because when we constantly go back and start with that, we constantly see where we are, and we constantly see our need for him. And then this next passage, we constantly see his grace for us and that he reached out to us in his grace and mercy. So don't let that be lost on you here in this moment. And so this section here, we saw the praise and the reminder of God's faithfulness, and we see his, Solomon's direct praise and address to God. He's humble. He appreciates who God is and what he's done. He understands his place. Now, in this next section here, verse 28, we kind of see Solomon, he shifts his focus now. He doesn't completely shift it away from God, but he shifts it on behalf of his people and himself. And he's calling on God's grace. So I want you to see this here in verse 28. It says, Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day, this place of which you said my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. It's a plea for grace and mercy. God, I know that our forgiveness comes from you. I know in order to to receive that forgiveness, you're gracious enough enough to give it to us, but we've got to turn to you. I've got to to look at you. And see here, he says, if they turn towards the temple, and and this can be a little bit confusing because we're like, what, we have to pray to a building? God doesn't, you just said he doesn't even dwell there. Yes, but he's put his name there. He's given them a place and a position to be able to pray to because otherwise they're running around going, I don't understand how to pray to God because I feel like I can only pray at the tent of meeting. Well, now he says, look, if you can pray in that direction, he just gives them perspective. He says, my eyes, God's eyes are always going to be looking on this place. In other words, I'm going to be looking for your prayers. I'm going to be looking for your pleas. I want to be there for you. And so he just gives them a point of reference and it's, And it's really beautiful. And in in the next section here, he has seven points of petition, seven ways that he says, God, we're people and we're going to sin. And we need your grace. All right, so let me break some of this down. In verse 31, he says, when anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath, God, step in. Okay, so he says, look, I'm the king and I prayed for wisdom and even I can't get it right all the time. So when people come to your temple, when they come here seeking um, justice, I pray, God, that you will divide, that you will that you will do what you can do alone and that you will allow the guilty to be guilty and the innocent to be innocent. When two people say. Well, I promise on the Bible that I'm not lying. I'm not lying. God, show up and do your thing. That's the first part of the prayer here. And the next section in verse 33, it says, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they've sinned against you. And when they turn back to you and give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave to their ancestors. Okay, so this is another thing. God says, look, when your people are wrong, when they have sinned, when they've been disobedient, against you, and they've had to face the consequences of being taken over by another people group. God, when they realize it, and they turn their hearts towards you, and they confess their sins, and they say, God, we were wrong. God, I pray that you will forgive your people, and you'll get them back on track. And he continues doing these things and and praying these, these different prayers 
all the way through. And he talks about, you know, when famines come because of what they've done, when they turn to you, forgive them and help them get straight. In verse 38, it says, and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people, Israel, be aware of of your people, Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading out their hands toward this temple, then hear from your heaven, your dwelling place. Forgive and act. Deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts. For you alone know every human, every human heart. And he says in verse 40, so that they will fear you all the time. They live in the land you gave your ancestors. He's He's not coming away. He's not saying, God, you're full of grace and your grace lets our sin slide. Do you see that here? Because there's a narrative in this world that says that if God loves us, he's going to let us, uh, he'll take care of our sins for us. If he really loved us, he'd be okay and everybody would go to, everyone would go to heaven. But that's not exactly how grace and mercy work. Because here's the thing, even though we got the unearned gift of salvation, and God was merciful and that he didn't punish us for our sins, he didn't let that sin go unpunished because he poured out his wrath on his son, Jesus. And so God doesn't let sin go. Someone and something has to deal with the consequences. And Jesus did that. And so every time we look at God and say, God, look, I'm wrong. God, I've sinned today in this area. I was disobedient in this area. I was, I was a jerk to my spouse today. God, I was mean to my kids. God, I, I gossiped and I slandered that person. God, I, I, I caused division in this way. God, I didn't display your name the way it should be. God, please forgive me and help me not to do this again. Solomon says, when the people do that, when they realize in their hearts they're wrong, hear their prayer, God. Okay, so at the same time, Solomon is praying this to God, but these people are hearing it. And so, in essence, he's praying, but he's preaching a sermon without even intending it because everyone behind him is hearing this thing. And they know where his heart is. All right, so we've got to continue for sake of time. In verse 41, it's really special. It says, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever they ask of you, so that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people, Israel, and may know that this house I've built bears your name. There's an evangelistic invitation in here. You hear this? Solomon says, when your people are doing right, when we're displaying the glory of God, and when other people that are not part of our family, when people who are not Christians, when people who are not not Jews, when the Gentiles, when they hear about how amazing you are and what you're doing, and when their heart compels them to turn to you, I pray, God, that you'll hear their prayers. It's it's really beautiful here. In verse 44 and 45, he talks about, look, God, when we're going to battle, when we've got things right and we're doing right and we pray to you, I pray, God, that you'll be with us. In verse 46, he continues and He's, and and it's, it's some more of this idea of when they sin and then they're taken into exile because of their sin. When they have to deal with their consequences and they're taken out of their land. God, when they turn to you and they repent, when they finally realize how wrong they are, I pray, God, that you'll hear them, you'll forgive them, and you'll come through. So that's this section as we go all the way to verse 53. It's these petitions. Now, I want you to see something in verse 54. I'm sorry, back up really quickly. Verse 22 said, Then Solomon stood before the altar, and he put his hands to heaven, and he prayed this prayer. In verse 54, it says, When Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplication to the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. What happened? He started out standing before a great and holy God. And he's pouring out his heart to him on behalf of himself and his people and and for those who don't know him. 
And he says, God, when we're wrong, because we're going to be wrong, and we turn to you, forgive us. And he ends up broken to his knees before God in heaven. He understands his place. He's not praying from a place of pride. He's not saying, God, you got to do this. He's pleading with God. And he's grateful and he's thankful for God's grace and his mercy. Is that your heart today? When you plead to God for forgiveness, are you still up on a high place? Are you willing to humble yourself and understand that God didn't have to do that? He didn't have to forgive you, but he is anyway. And when you think like that, you can't help but be here. That should be the posture of our hearts. This is Solomon's prayer for his people. And he turns as we close here. He turns and it says in verse 55, it said, he stood and he blessed the whole assembly. So he stands up and he looks at all of them and he calls out to them. He says, praise be to the Lord in verse 56 who has given rest to his people, Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed all of his good promises he gave through his servant Moses. Don't miss verse 57. He says, may the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. 58, may he turn our hearts to him, to walk in obedience to him, And to keep the commands, the decrees and laws he gave our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I pray before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night. That he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to to today's and each day's need. And verse verse 60, I want you to pay attention to verse 60 and 61. It says, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. And verse 61, and may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. He challenges the people. He stands, he turns to them. He challenges them to take his prayer seriously. And he challenges them to live fully committed lives for the Lord. Underline that in verse 61. He says, people, you heard my prayer. You see where I'm coming from. I understand who God is, at least on my human level. I'm the wisest man to ever walk this earth, and even I'm on my knees. I want you to understand and live by his statutes, live by his commands, be obedient to him, and it says be fully committed. He says don't just do right once in a while. Your whole lifestyle from your heart all the way to your actions should be fully committed to God and do what he says in his word. And then he he jumps at the end and he dedicates the temple. He challenges the people and then they start the sacrifices and they start to do all these things. And the people are super excited and they're just bringing tons of sacrifices. And it's just an absolutely beautiful scene. It's joyous. In fact, this festival of tabernacles, he he did it at this time because he was like, hey, we're we're celebrating our temporary. We're celebrating our journey in in a place where we're finally setting up permanence. And it's normally seven days, but this thing went for 14 days. So they had a double party. And it says when the people left, they were just so excited and they were full of joy because they understood who God was and they they understood where they've come and they understood where they were going and they were all in in that moment, right? Now we know they don't stay all in and we don't stay all in all the time, do we either? Now I invite you to read that. I invite you to read the passage and, and, and just kind of go over it again. But what do we do with this? Well, let me ask you, have you remembered God's faithfulness in your life? Are you cynical and you can't stand what's happening today? Remember God's faithfulness. Remember how he showed up in your life. And if you're like, I can't remember him showing up anywhere. Well, you're sitting here in this church. And if you're sitting here in this church, maybe you're listening to this message because you've actually accepted Christ as your Savior. Well, he showed up if he gave you his spirit. Am I right? 
You see, for these people, they had a temple, and His glory came down in that temple. But then later on in the book of Acts, it says that the glory came down on the people who accepted Christ, who chose to be Christ followers, and the Holy Spirit that day came down like fire and dwelt on them. And it dwelt in them. So these temples... We've got the Holy Spirit in us. We've got God in us. It was God with us in Jesus Christ. He looked at the lady at the well and he said, look, you're looking at a temple when you got the temple right before you. John 1.14 says that Jesus Christ came down and tabernacled with us. He made himself a temple for us. So my question is, have you remembered his faithfulness? Have you acknowledged God for who he is and have you praised him for who he is? Because this is what Solomon was doing that day when he was dedicating this temple and he was dedicating his people. I want to follow you, God. And when you realize that, do you realize that you've got sin in your life that needs to be taken care of? What now? Take care of the sin. Turn to God. God, look, I've done wrong to you. I confess And I want to turn to you. And finally, have you dedicated your temple? Have you dedicated your temple? Have you dedicated your body? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Have you dedicated it to God? In the end, the words that say they dedicated the temple, it's this idea of they set the temple up to do what it was called to do. Well, have you allowed your body to be used the way God called it to be used? Ephesians 2.10. He's got plans for you. Dedicate your temple. Give it all to God. Fully committed in his word and in his love. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much that we can come together this morning and that we can read your passage and read your word. And I pray, God, that this morning that this word, these words will not return void. I pray that they'll have an impact. I pray that the people will love and appreciate how you show us how gracious you are in forgiving us of all these possible sins. And I pray that we'll live fully committed lives to you, that we'll dedicate these temples to your service for you. And it's in Jesus' holy name, the name above all names, we all say, amen. See you next week. We'll pick up in 1 Kings.